the decision to become a gallerist is, I, th I think, one that most people back into. I don't think that little children, you know, when they're playing, <laughs> say that they want to be art dealers when they grow up. We had galleries that showed pop art, Leo Castelli, Sidney Janis. We didn't need another pop gallery. There was a need for conceptual work, which is where I came in. So I opened the gallery on West Broadway. Well, the first difficulty I had was that I couldn't open a checking account in my own name, because that's the state that women were in at the time. That was the status quo in 1975. My mother helped me, and it was $1,200 a month rent, and the artists understood that if they wanted to do a show, that they had to bring it in and put it up. We did all kinds of things there. We did dance recitals. We did an opera that Teeny Duchon brought to me, and I wrote conceptual plays, although we didn't know it was conceptual at the time. Holly had uh, 98 Green Street before, which was a, a venue for showing performance art and where I first showed my videos. She was the most avid of my collectors when I was showing at Sonnabend. And uh, when she started her own gallery, she said, I know that you're with Ileana and I'm not going to try to steal you or anything, but if ever you want to come to my gallery. Uh, and a, a couple of years later, I, I, I did. I went with Holly. It seemed that Ileana was a really great dealer, but she had more energy for the back room situation. I remember once having a show and, and some, a young couple came in and uh, wanted to find out about my work. And she was bus busy with Warhol and Dine and Johns and those people, where Holly would come out and talk to absolutely anybody. Holly, how could you not like Holly? She always. Um wanted you to come look and see what she had. She didn't push you to um, buy it or collect it, but you always usually took something away. She invited me to a dinner on one of my New York visits. As I walked in, the, I was like in, just in shock. I have never gone to any apartment where every inch, every corner, every table, everything had art. When I was a young curator here, we had a sales and rental gallery and we were always combing around for things that we could bring down to Baltimore to offer to Baltimore collectors and rent. And Holly was one of the most generous uh, dealers in New York making things available. And what she had was always, you know, kind of crazy and wacky and, you know, off to the side and surprising and challenging in that way. I mean, it, Holly Solomon's taste wasn't in any way a classic taste, but one that was really informed. Gordon telephoned me. We spoke all the time, because I was Gordon's, I guess you would call it, patron. And he said to me, Holly, I need a house. And I said, oh. And he said, Holly, I want to split a house in half. I said, oh, Gordon, isn't that nice? What, what can I do for you? He said, well, get me a house. She opened the door to another world, because her artists, the pattern artists, also introduced us to the East, to India, to a different way of seeing. I mean, there have been many, many names that went through the gallery or went through 98 Green Street, from uh, Neil Jenny, Thomas Lanigan Schmidt, uh, Nam June Paik later on, uh, myself, Robert Maplethorpe, Laurie Anderson, Zygma Polka's first show in New York was at Holly's. Um, God, Gordon Mata Clark, of course. I mean. Stuff legends are made from. It was easy to tell who was going to be important, who had the stamina, who had the energy, who had the ideas, and who would have the 
personality because all these things go into making art. I got a phone call from her gallery saying she wanted to come to the studio. So she came, she came with Horace, and she said, I'd like you to start next May or something like that in a small room. And I said, well, I don't do small. And Horace thought, well, who's this obnoxious kid? Let's get up and leave. And Holly said, I like that. So what are we doing? <laughs> And I said, we're doing a wedding. And she said, a wedding? I always wanted to have a wedding in the gallery. It was called the Meta Bride. And we had a big performance at the gallery on Easter Sunday with a 15-piece orchestra and a contortionist bride. It was magic. And Holly served little pretentious uh, tomato and um, cucumber sandwiches. grandmother who had lived in New York was an artist and uh, my mother was a, a newscaster primarily about the arts. The first exhibition when my parents have always been very supportive of me but um, the stacks of paper on the floor really sort of threw them for a bit of a loop <laughs> when I first opened. I've never hesitated to take on an artist because I thought that they were financially viable. I'd made the decision to open a gallery in the spring of 89. But it was already the summer and I probably didn't have a single artist that I was absolutely sure about showing. I probably went to, God, five studio visits a day, literally. I probably went to 20, 25 studio visits a week. It's just really fantastic to have a complete sense of knowing what was out there, what, was, what, what the options were. Although I opened just a few months before the major recession of 1990, uh, for some reason, it actually worked month to month. Part of it was that I was a gallery that was showing really emerging artists, very young artists, um, and so people could still afford to buy that work. The way that I chose artists really evolved over time. Obviously, the first thing is to sort of simply be inspired by the work on a, on a purely physical level and, um, and to have a physical, you know, an aesthetic kinship, which is very important. Ultimately, it's very, very subjective. It's my first solo show in Andrea's gallery, which was in 1992. The show was sort of an explosion of a whole bunch of different sorts of things. There was writing on yellow legal pad, which at this point was what I was well known for. There were sculptures out of um, wet clay. She's been always so supportive of me if I've done something new and in, in partially insane that was really difficult to sell. Difficult in other people's eyes comes in all kinds of forms, whether it's you know, a stack of paper that people can take away and people don't understand how it can be regenerated to, you know, large-scale objects that, uh, that people have to live with and interact with, like Andrea Zatel's work. Um, so it's never um, an issue for me about the form of the work. The gallery's primary agenda has always been the very long-term representation of artists. One of the many things that attracted me to Andrea was that once she believed in an artist in their artwork, she would transfer her confidence in the work <clears throat> to people who were interested in it in the first place. So people would come to my show and want to talk to the dealer and say, can you explain this to me? I've not seen this before. Andrea being thoroughly convinced and very enthusiastic, very powerful, and uh, always with many sentences at the ready to describe what I was doing, was very good at um, selling work that was probably amazingly difficult to sell. Someone like Andrea Rosen She could is, talk you under the table no, about that. But Andrea production. Rosen, on the other hand, is right out there. I mean, when the person walks into the gallery, she is enthusiastic about meeting the collector, and, or meeting the artist for that matter, to really engage in the work. And there isn't uh, all the time, of, she has all the time in the world to look at the work and talk about the work. father used to have his own little art shows, he would get posters, so we would have a Van Gogh 
hanging, and then we would have a Cezanne hanging. So it was always there. When I was an adolescent, I thought my father was mad, <laughs> but for him it was a great passion. And as I got older, one way that I could spend time with him when I came home from college was to go to museums. And then I thought, well, if I'm really so serious about it and I love it so much, then I should take it seriously. And I went back to school in studying art history. Well, I had a painting by Milton Avery, and I sold it, and I took the money and put it into multiples. We each put in $5,000 to, to start our venture. There was an excitement about it, and we managed to get off to a decent start, and of course the venture got larger and larger and more successful. I remember making a very beautiful piece of cloisonné jewelry with uh, Roy Lichtenstein. I remember that we sold the pin for $25, and it was a lovely object, and we were all very proud to keep the price so that everybody could have something beautiful by Roy Lichtenstein. I think at a certain period that artists began to have a different attitude towards doing additions, and it, the, the social aspect of it slowly petered out and really began to let the multiples go and to concentrate more and more on the gallery as it grew and my interest in artists, other artists grew. One of the most impressive things that I remember that she ever did uh, was that we were, ha we were showing out some Kiefer and he started making larger and larger and larger paintings. So he had this phenomenal work and we were we had moved to West 57th Street and we were in this gallery for a couple of years and it was clear that his paintings were not going to fit into our gallery. So what does Marianne do? She moves the gallery for this show. When I was showing Kiefer, I remember a collector saying to me, you have bet on the wrong German. And I was so embarrassed to have to say, I think you're wrong. So I said, well, let's just talk again next year. Marion Goodman. Um, you have is... an absolute faith that she knows which is the good piece. And, and she tells you, when she offers you a piece, you know it's a good piece. Well, also Marion uh, is someone who, I think more than any other dealer, has probably, if you really analyze the amount of travel that Marion has, has, uh, ha has taken to investigate and explore art in the world. I, th I don't think any other dealer can match the amount of crusade on her part. I think I now represent four generations of artists. The youngest is, I think, was just 30 or 31, and the oldest was just 70. So that's quite a time span. We're meeting with Mary, and Juan and I have been working on a and on a, I guess we'd have to call it a retrospective, although artists hate that word retrospective because it makes them sound so old. We're really Thanks. trying to do the first major book to, to accompany the show. I think the thing that I'm most proud of is how well the artists have been received in museum shows here and in Europe. And at the moment, I'm really thrilled to say that well, to be very precise, there are 18 artists in the gallery who will have major one-man shows between now, May, and next May. Where would American art be today if it wouldn't be for what Ileana did, taking it to Europe and and showing it and then bringing European back here and having appreciation of American collectors appreciating contemporary European art so that this dialogue could go back and forth. In our mind, we were going to go to Europe to show a whole lot of very interesting, very young and, and very new artists. After a few weeks in Paris, Leo's friend he had this uh, gallery and she would like to rent the gallery on a monthly basis. We decided to open in that space, but open only for six months we had, because we had six artists that we wanted to show. But it happened differently. 
because, <laughs> because uh, the gallery became quite successful. But we also survived because it was so scandalous what we were doing. <laughs> we intended to stay for six months, but we stayed 18 years. So we created our own little revolution in Paris. <laughs> I find her choices of art are very tough. You know, they're not at all sweet and seductive and easy. They're always, they're always edgy. And uh, that's one of the qualities that's, uh, that's so remarkable and makes the, the experience of looking at all the objects together, whether whatever artist they're by, there's a commonality in that kind of edginess. And the, the choice is so intelligent. It's not, she doesn't seek out beauty. We knew of Gilbert and George. We thought we, it would be a very interesting show to show in New York. It was not an opening night, it was an opening day. Since they did go on doing the same thing over and over and over for eight hours, there was an, an enormous, an enormous crowd. I think that for New York also it was totally unique. The Ritz say never side for the Carlton they can keep. There's only one place that I know. Happy when the daylight comes creeping. Hell in the dawn, sleeping when it's raining. I dream my dreams away. Underneath the arches. On cobblestones we lay. When I first started looking at contemporary art, it was coming into Soho in the mid 70s, and Sonnenberg Gallery was one of a handful of galleries there, and um, it's kind of where I cut my teeth. It was also one of the galleries where I really couldn't understand a lot of what I was seeing when I first saw it. I mean, I'll never forget a show with Vito Acconci where there was a plank, a table and a plank extending out the window onto the street in Soho. Speakers hanging over the table, uh, a row of stools, and this, you know, low rumbling voice of Acconci. And I had to think, now how does a place like this stay open? Vito would be for several hours masturbating under under the floor. Vito Acconci uh, made this piece that was precisely about the idea of the artists fertilizing the, the gallery. Made in Heaven was a, a show in which Jeff Koons extended his sexual life and into a subject matter for his works. I guess we are not very easy to censor. When Gilbert and George made the that show that dealt with race, religion, and sex. There was this collector uh, who came to the gallery. He was very shocked and he told Nick, who uh, works with us, does Mrs. Sonnebund realize that a show like this could ruin her reputation? And I remember she told him, oh well, tell him that my reputation has been ruined since so long I have nothing, nothing to fear. Ilya is amazing. What an incredible thing to do at her age to build this whole new gallery and come to Chelsea where, where everything is happening. I think the role of an art dealer is a complex one, but I think uh, the main thing is to, uh, to be supportive, to be a platform uh, for the artist. But it really wasn't until working with Ileana that there was somebody uh, behind me that truly was just interested in seeing these things exist. As far as the financial aspect of things, there's really no concern for that. It was really about seeing this work uh, exist and uh, to produce it. The first year that I went out of Italy uh, to work with Ileana, it was very interesting because 1964 was a period that uh, Ileana presented the pop art to Europe. I was a gallery assistant. I put the stamps over the 
envelopes. I don't think I learned anything about art dealing. I don't know how, what is art dealing. I learned about art. Before I opened my gallery, I uh, was uh, using a loft at 421 West Broadway, which was owned by Larry Gagosian, who was a friend. I didn't finance my gallery when I opened it in Soho in 1980. I think that I had to give, come up with a very great amount for me at the time of $100,000. Had um, sold privately uh, several works of uh, David Sully and Julian Schnabel and um, Eric Fischer, and so then I had it. One of the great tragedies about Anina, in my mind, is that she's shown a number of very fine artists, given them their first show, but hasn't been able to hold on to them. And I don't quite know what the reason for that is. People consider a tragedy not to make so much money, but it's not a tragedy for me. I would feel guilty if people would feel sorry for me. Generally, the best works of art, the, the ones that interest me the most, are the works of art that uh, are made by the artist in the first five years of uh, my getting interested. In general, I think that at a certain point, the artist might need a financing of their projects, particularly in the case of Shirin Neshat, with films, that um, involves a, a, a vision of money that I don't have. It's really not my specialty and not my interest. There are other galleries that are larger in that sense, in financial uh, resources. By Nina was the first one who, I could say, discovered my work in Venice Biennial in 1995, where I had no representation anywhere, and in fact, um, I had no ambition to really have a career in art, so when she in fact approached me, I was sort of caught in surprise, like me, you know, having a show in New York. But that's the way she is with Anina, and I think that's what I admire about her the most, is that uh, ability to recognize and, 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 and support an artist in such an early stage. And she just went all the way. She gave me a full solo show when I didn't even know who I was, and so, um, I was very lucky in that sense to have encountered someone like Anina. I still remember the day in Anina the Size Gallery she said, I'm going to take you down to the basement. And there was John Michel Basquiat living there and doing the first work of his I, I ever saw. You can see, and it's right there in all works, what is meaningful. And uh, as I said before, nothing is hidden in the work in the works of art. I went um, to the show that Diego Cortez had organized at PS1, which was called New New York. It was an enormous show with many, many artists. And um, I was specifically looking for new artists. The one that interested me the most was Jean-Michel Basquiat. And Jean-Michel um, told me right away that he wanted to participate to a group show immediately. And I agreed to put him in a show even though he did not have enough work or didn't have the work yet. So I gave him some money, bought the canvas, we discussed some canvas when he showed them to me were not finished, mostly did not have a place to paint large canvas, which is what he wanted to do. So I told him that he could work in the basement, which he did, and I presented the works that he did, which were beautiful. I started in the print business, but I abandoned it really quickly. It was more interesting to me to be more involved with the artist himself or herself and to know everything that was going on. And when you do prints, basically, you, you work with one aspect, but you don't work with the whole artist. All the films that I've produced so far have been produced by Barbara Gladstone, I mean, in terms of the uh, production cost and everything. She gave me the comfort of being able to just concentrate on the art and my ideas. I don't tell them ever what to do. I don't suggest what they should do. If, there's, um, if there are problems which I can help with, of course I'm happy to do it, but uh, producing in this sense means to me just backing them and um, giving them the opportunity to do what they want to do um, in their practice. I went down to this basement and there was this Vaseline sculpture. You can imagine to see Vaseline in a sculpture, frozen. It was so um, unearthly and beautiful and I had never, never, never seen it before. It was so strange that my heart started to beat. This is the most incredible beginning. 
I have ever seen. It's not only that work is good, because there's a lot of work that is good, but sometimes, I can't speak for anyone else, but I suddenly get this feeling that I know exactly what to do, and I'm the one who would be right for it. At a certain moment during the 80s, when everybody was thinking about um, a lot of new things, especially in the East Village, I would go over there dutifully on a Sunday, and I would look at the latest new thing, and I would say, oh, Richard Prince did that. So I called Richard Prince, <laughs> who, who basically had to be convinced. <laughs> Remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was happily without representation at the time living in a dump. Again, it was just it was just a try. I mean, who knew we were going to end up like with 13 years, I mean. That's a, it's a long time, really. I met Virginia uh, as part of a stable, young artists, uh, who had previously been part of a cooperative group called the Corman Gallery. Virginia had known Corman, I believe, at the Institute of Fine Arts, where they had been students. And she purchased from him the stable for $1. So it was in 1954 that uh, I met her, along with uh, 12, 14 other young artists. Pat Adams, who was with Virginia from the very beginning as a painter, and is still represented by Zabriskie Gallery. So I think that this may be a record in the history of art, that an artist and a dealer have a, 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 a relationship that is so singular and so sustained for almost 50 years. I charged all my artists $100 to shop with me, and I have my little notebooks from selling a picture for $35 then. We only took a third in commission instead of today's 50%. The first person that came in my gallery was a fuller brush man, and I bought a brush. It was in the mid-1970s at the time that she opened her Paris gallery, and she was really unique, I think, in terms of the fact that she was taking photography and uh, incorporating it as a medium equal to painting and sculpture in her gallery. I realized that there were no photo galleries in Paris and that photography had already begun as a very viable collectible here in the United States. Also, it was extremely mobile. You can put a whole show under your arm and carry it to Paris. Virginia uh, Zabriskie was interested in it was to show American photography in France and to show French photography in America. I have to admit that Virginia uh, literally rediscovered French photographers that were absolutely neglected even by the French at the time. Something that happened one, during the time that I was working in the gallery, and Virginia was well, um, you know, I mean, very much involved in working with surrealism at that time. And she had come across years before a work by an extremely obscure French woman surrealist named Claude Cahan. This woman was making this work in the 1920s and 30s and was virtually unknown until Virginia showed her in the 90s, first in New York and then in the Paris Gallery. Now she's extremely well known and has been written about by a lot of scholars and people have done doctoral dissertations on her and um, she's part of the whole canon of you know modern photography. I do want to speak about my voice because what I have <laughs> is something generally that's called dystonia. It's a muscular spasm disorder which affects your hands, your speech, your eyes. This, in my case, is genetic. I began to lose my speech or recognize that I was losing it when I was about 31. I really feel I'm a gallerist.
And that's a person who has a gallery, who does an exhibition. I have a hard time in seeing myself as an art dealer or as an art merchant. I've done perhaps 750 exhibitions in my life over a 43 year period, and I've never had a day in between one of them. When I moved to New York, and it was 1970, I was 19 years old, and I was a bit of a country bumpkin. The first time I met Mary, she was working as a secretary at the Bikert Gallery for Klaus Curtis up on 81st Street. And it was amazing. I hadn't been in the gallery for more than 30 seconds. Then she knew my name, and she's great about the way she works people and their personalities. I, I always offered people who worked for me a commission if they built their own client list and Mary was the first person to take me up on that and and went at it in spades. It was really good to have somebody that was that energetic in the gallery. I apprenticed in the gallery for four years and then worked on my own for another two. Um, and then there were a couple of years in between there, so that by the time the gallery started getting any level of recognition, I had already had 11 years in the art world. Somehow, out of all the young dealers that were beginning to uh, emerge, she somehow secured this, this very coveted spot. When I first opened up, I started with a very small space. It was less than a thousand square feet. and. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say that my monthly overhead was $7,000 a month. I kept everything very modest, but with the understanding that, you know, if any of the artists started to become successful, that we would be able to expand. From 77 to 1980, things, in fact, more than expanded, I would say they exploded. She moved over to her big gallery, her first big gallery at 417 West Broadway, which was across the street from the little baby gallery that she opened. I think pretty quickly, within a couple of years, she became somewhat of a celebrity. New York Magazine thought that she warranted a cover. It was like a coronation. They called her the queen of the new art scene. I came to New York in 1970, and maybe I opened my own gallery in 1977. But if someone was reading about this in 1985, it was like, oh yeah, you're the girl who just opened that gallery. And, you know, it took a year to sell my first Schnabel painting, who was, you know, Schnabel, who was considered to be my, you know, biggest, hottest star. And, you know, I think it's important for young artists to know this, you know, to know that Bryce Martin had seven solo shows and didn't sell a painting. Mary really had trouble selling my paintings at the beginning for the first three shows, actually. To her credit, she, she kept showing me. It must be very frightening to open a gallery and think no one's ever gonna come and buy anything. So in exchange for backing, they would get you know, the choice of work from the shows, which you know, worked for the advantage of both. She actually develops a career for an artist. It's a, it's a, uh, a thing that goes through uh, good times and bad times. Uh, she doesn't seem to work any less hard when it's going good than it is when it's going bad. She definitely works really hard when it's going bad. She's been supportive in a lot of ways, uh, financially as well as emotionally. And a lot of other dealers are not artist dealers, they're product dealers, which is if they, they have a, a painting and it sells, they sell it. If it doesn't sell, they'll show the collector something by somebody else. When she does see a new artist whose work she likes, she really pursues them and it makes it be very irresistible for them. And sometimes too in conjunction with galleries they're already with, she's not out to make them sever their ties with somebody or you know, burn bridges. She's perfectly willing to work with other galleries, but often the other galleries aren't willing to work with her, so you know, in some cases the artists have actually left their galleries and come to the gallery, to Mary Boone.
I think Mary Boone was always behind closed doors. And in fact, when you did get into her uh, office, which was always small and perfect, she was not someone to sit around and really engage in a, in a, a deep conversation about the emotional and psychological implications of the work. It was like a good painting or a bad painting. I think probably the biggest issue with Mary is her attention to minute details. It's something that runs through everything she does, from the way she dresses, to the way you write an invoice, to the way the catalogs are prepared. Everything has her stamp of style to it. You, you really grow to appreciate. I've been with Mary now almost 20 years, so it's, a, it's like a marriage in a way. <laughs> You know, it's got uh, some rough spots. Her reason for being is to give you enough time, money, and whatever to, to make it comfortable enough for you to do the work. You can't ask for more. <laughs> what more could you want from a dealer? I really believe in leaving an artist alone to make their work. I, I have never told an artist what to make or what not to make. Having the shows happen is another kind of situation. Because I feel that, you know, what a show is about is really introducing this work to the public and the dealer becomes like the translator, I usually work with the artist to try to select what they feel are the strongest works and to um, put them together in the show in a way that makes a cohesive story. I started working in New York in 1959 was my first job in a gallery, my apprenticeship. Everything was happening. Pop art was beginning, you had the abstract expressionists, you had minimal art beginning, you had happenings, and it was just a fantastic time. First show that the gallery did when it opened in 1968 was a benefit show for uh, student mobilization against the war in Vietnam and the veterans against the war in Vietnam. And that's another thing. People told me I was crazy to move to Prince Street. And then they said, you're crazy to open with a benefit show against the war. You know, so everything I did was against. Oh, I met Paula in 1969. She came to my studio to look at work and picked a drawing to be in an exhibition. And I think our relationship began. I mean, she was interested in my work, I was interested in her. Well, I remember Paula was downtown and I was working downtown, so, it, and, you know, Paula was clearly an interesting dealer and it was an exciting gallery. It just made total sense. After I got out of graduate school, or sort of close to that time, I moved to Soho and the only other people there um, at the time, working that I knew of was an artist called Paul Waldman. John Borofsky was across the street, and there were no street lights. The restaurant was Finale's in some place called OG, and there was the Paula Cooper Gallery, which was on the second floor um, on Prince Street. And uh, that's where we met. The artists whom I showed, they hadn't shown yet, and we were like an extended family. We really spent a lot of time together. We were very good friends, had lots of dinners and parties. We were very close. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of, uh, you know, tastefulness about Paula's choices. Also an intense involvement with the artist that she works with. Something that you see with Paula is a championship of the radical. I think certainly when she became enamored of and started supporting minimal and conceptual work, um, that practice was the most radical practice of the time of the 60s. You know, it is that kind of pushing of boundaries, of pushing the edge, that's drawn her to so many of the artists she's shown. And her support of performance art and of the music, people like Peter Kotick, EOS Orchestra, um, Philip Glass very early on, you know, uh, Merce Cunningham. I mean, these were people who were truly, um, you know, on the edge, and they were, were, they were establishing new practices. Well, I guess one can see from 
the history of the gallery and, and from my career uh, that I've always been interested in all aspects of art and intellectual pursuit. Uh, so now we have the bookstore. At the time we always, we had concerts, we had dancers, we had performance. The gallery was always open to artists who needed to use it. Paula is um, one of the most cryptic dealers. She, she actually says very little, but it's more about a, a kind of spirit of engagement. So Paula, you feel, is you can see her eyes looking at something. And I think she communicates more directly through that and through um, just the, the, her sense of her own personal commitment to work. Paula has a long view. She, she's not easily impressed. It's a very clear seeing of the work itself, not the hype around it, not the reviews, not what's on that person's resume. Thinking about Paula, she is somebody, and Ileana too, who's absolutely kept current and not, not at all stuck in a certain period. She started out with emerging artists and, and stuck with them while they became very well known, but then she's kind of rejuvenated things with emerging artists again. I liked what I'd heard, that she represented people for a long period of time, that uh, artists stayed with her for 20, 30 years. I like the intergenerational thing. Um, there are things that sometimes I feel I've missed out on um, when an artist and their gallerist are a peer and they're kind of coming up in the world together and maybe hungry in a similar way. Um, I'm catching Paul at a different point in her life. There are two reasons why a seasoned veteran dealer continues to look at the work of young artists. One is because some of their seasoned artists are stolen by other dealers and they have to fill their stables. And the other is because in order to remain contemporary you have to continue to evolve. And there's often something gained by contextualizing the work of the more senior artists with younger artists. And new generations emerge and dealers want to keep a vital business going. I really don't know why artists leave Anina Desai or Mary Boone or any other dealer. It's, the relationship between a dealer and an artist is a very uh, intimate one in, in, in many ways. And uh, uh, artists have certain personalities and dealers have certain personalities and sometimes uh, those personalities clash after a period of time. So uh, eventually I was going to um, have a show with Mary and Mary was uh, representing the work but uh, it didn't happen, and I was pulled away by Anina Nose to uh, go work with Anina, so I was with Anina for a very brief time period. Uh, Nina placed some of my works, and then just one day uh, called me up and said, Jeff, I lost interest in your work. Uh, what you installed last night in my home, come and get it. So I suppose that the first five years of the younger artist, I show their work and I do one, two, three shows. And then when their prices are higher and they go to other galleries, I often keep the friendship, but um, not the money. Askian is an artist that we did several shows with, although Anina showed him first. Barbara Kruger is another artist that we've done a lot of shows, and I think I've been her dealer for almost 20 years, but Anina showed her first. Anina. It has this reputation of launching careers, that she has, has been instrumental in bringing a lot of these artists to the public's attention and to the attention of museum curators and, and writers. And that once these artists uh, start to get the recognition for their work, they are very tempted by the opportunity to enhance their careers by going to a larger uh, situation. And they do. There was always like this, this, this gentlemanness about the artist being in the specific gallery, and that and once that relationship was there, it was kind of a holy relationship. But I think Mary was probably the one to initiate like uh, uh, breaking those boundaries, meaning that uh, if she liked an artist that somebody else had, she had no problem chasing that artist. It wasn't <laughs> just Mary that. Uh recruited them, I think they actively sought out Mary. I thought they, they sought, the, Mary was the brightest candle. Quite a few artists who have become very successful through the years with us have been picked off by other galleries who are more interested in just making money. So uh, when that first happened, 
I was devastated personally, you know, because I had been working with these artists for 20 years. But it was very good for the gallery. It was very good for me. And now we work a little bit differently. So we work with some younger artists. We work with some artists who are mid-career. We work with older artists. And I work with the secondary market a lot more because so many of the artists that I've worked with, they are the secondary market. Why did I leave Paula? Well, you know, I don't know, it was, a, it was a massive conflict for me. I mean, I was sort of, I guess, probably bored. Not by her, bored by myself. So I wanted change. I, I mean, I was fully content with Paula as a dealer. I mean, I had no complaints. Somehow I just felt that I wanted to experience. I, w I just wanted to be seen in some other context. I think I started showing with Holly in 78 and then she moved from Soho to Fifth Avenue and around that time I started to think that I should separate my photographs from my paintings and drawings because a photo gallery as in Pace McGill uh, who I went with was more capable of curating it, of handling the work. Also, I thought it was very, since my mind was very divided about what I was doing, I thought that I should have a place for my paintings and a place for my photographs. And uh, how it inspired me and, and was inspired by my paintings, so I thought that was a good place to show. One of the uh, most poignant moments that I've had in my experience with Mary Goodman Gallery was when we stopped working with Anselm Kiefer. It wasn't um, the loveliest moment or the loveliest way to find out. There was an ad in Art Forum magazine and someone had told us that there was going to be a show elsewhere. She just pulled herself right up and went forward and started working with younger artists who have had major success. The best primary market dealers are really concerned with placing the work properly. So the idea that a dealer will choose to whom to sell a work, although that might uh, seem to um, um, be offensive by the standard practices of American um, open market system, is in fact the best thing that they can do for an artist. Barbara was showing George Kondo, and one day she finally decided, well, we had enough George Kondo. We, of course, didn't think we had enough George Kondo. So we were in Basel at the art fair, and someone told us that they had seen the lovely pieces of George Kondo at uh, Leo Leo Ruma. Ruma in Naples. So five o'clock in the morning, Leah calls this lawyer in Rome. He says, well, I have these American collectors. They're crazy about this piece. And uh, he said, you know, I have to give them an answer. And he says, but I'm fairly awake. He said, I'm awake. He said, you're crazy. I refuse to believe. I think this is just a ploy. We ended up with a piece only because he was a very nice man who was convinced that we were out of our minds and, and passionate he, enough to, to and deserve he wanted having to go the back piece. To sleeves. And we physically took the piece back with us, only to demonstrate to Barbara Gladstone so that she can't stop us from acquiring right. more pieces by artists that she represents. And that's the story of art and life. <laughs> <laughs> to me, a true collector is obsessed. It, a, it, a true collector is an addict, someone who cannot stop collecting. It doesn't mean that they don't collect discriminately, but there's always something that interests them. There's a kind of voracious appetite, a desire to consume in the, in the fullest sense. Each of the, the dealers have a wildly disparate selling style. With Andrea, I mean, you, you, she talks until you, you sort of give up and say, okay, I'll get the piece. Uh, with Paula Cooper, you, you tell her that you want something and then she forgets and you tell her again you want and you sort of finally you get down on your hands and knees and you beg her please you know give me and this piece. And then she says oh did, you're interested in the piece? It's and then Ileana had the best technique of all is that uh, when she was in, the, in a moment of greatest heat no you, you never knew what piece you were buying. She said well list your three favorite pieces and she said when we have everybody's favorite pieces we're gonna get together one night and we're gonna we're gonna match them up and we'll try and come as close as we can to giving each person their favorite piece the thing with Ileana is if you were really good and really fast and did everything right you can bend the set you can buy the second best piece in the show because Ileana always bought the best piece in the show uh, and Ileana's collection is probably better than any other collector in the world for this reason, but she always had first pick in her own shows. Some collectors become so engaged in the activity that they outgrow their own homes, and at a certain point they have to decide what happens with the art. 
uh, in the late 80s, there developed a phenomenon of the private museum. Eli Broad in Los Angeles developed a foundation. The Rubels in Florida developed their own private foundation where, where they could display their work. So we more or less had some idea how many pieces we had, but not exactly. And then we found this incredible uh, drug and weapon confiscation center in Florida and moved the collection down there where we now show the collection. Actually, we have 8,000 pieces of art. You have an exhibition and you send out invitations. People come. You know, they come, and they come, and they look, and they're curious, and I don't think you'd ever have trouble finding collectors because they're looking for you. About 99% of my work is bought from dealers, the gallery owners, because they give you all the information. They talk to you about artists. The, the best part about, I always found going to Virginia, is she has everything there, and she doesn't always know quite what she has or isn't focused on it because it's been collected over the years. I really enjoy going to see a show, and then seeing if there's anything in the back room that might be something of, uh, of interest. We tend to think of collectors as being rich and impossible people who have bad characters somehow if you collect art. But it's not true because truly collectors preserve these ideas and this work for future generations. Some of the art dealers of the time are, were collectors, are collectors. Ileana was a collector, and that's how I first met her, too. Uh, actually, I was showing with Ileana, and uh, Holly was the person collecting my work most. Being part of the art community is to be a patron and to collect. And really, that's the kick in it for me. There weren't many collectors in Paris. Quite a few pieces that I had on consignment and that I couldn't sell. I had to buy the whole show and it, was a, it turned out to be a very successful transaction. So that is the beginning of the collection, so-called. You see? We buy things and uh, we don't see them anymore because uh, they, they are either are lent or stored. The works that we have on uh, view from Ileana are particularly strong in the abstract expressionist pop area because that's an area of our collection that isn't very strong. We have about 52 works uh, on loan from Ileana. And, you know, at, at any given time, there's about 15 on view right now and 23 out on loan. It's a very strange feeling when I go to to museums and, and see my paintings. I haven't seen a painting for a long time and I find it in a museum. I'm very touched. It's, it's as if I saw an old friend and say, ah, there you are. <laughs> you know, most people say that one of the only ways that you can actually make this financially viable or lucrative is to collect your own artists and unfortunately I, I haven't done that. I'm not a collector. I'm much more interested in being inspired on a day-to-day -day basis by something than I am about the possession of the object. But I don't really collect. I have a lot of works of art that have remained uh, in my ownership because I didn't sell them. I didn't get to sell them. And those were the, in many cases, the lucky financially the lucky cases because then if I sold them later they were much more expensive. If you run a gallery five years before I bought anything. Uh, now I do buy. I buy for inventory and I buy well and I think this has been an important part of my business. I would definitely say that for me I would have never started the gallery if I wasn't absolutely naive about every aspect of it, and specifically the finances. I don't know, maybe I'm obsessive. <laughs> Many times I thought, oh, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to have such difficult times with the artists as well as difficult times commercially. Then I thought of, of the art and that it is worth enduring. I mean, I can't imagine doing anything else, really. But it's, I think if you do what you love to do, you're so very lucky. Good dealers really do work extremely hard. It's a hard life. It's not. We make it look easy. I'm rather proud of going to the Chelsea Hotel. Whether this will be my final destination, I don't know. I'm 
leaving everything open-ended. I just feel that right now this is suitable for me. And I think it's very good to live in the present. So that's what we're all trying to do here. <laughs>